we were looking the last three sessions <clears throat> at that phrase in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, that says, God's promises are magnificent and precious, and the ultimate goal of all his promises is that we might partake of his nature. That is the greatest gift that God can give us in our human bodies. <clears throat> and um, to recap what we've covered in the last three sessions, in the first session we looked at 1 Samuel 2.30. God says, those who honor me, I will honor. It's a fantastic promise that Almighty God who runs this universe is going to honor me. What are all the empty honors of earth? compared to that. You can take all the honors of earth put together, which people on earth think are so wonderful and throw it in the trash can, compared to Almighty God saying, I will honor you. I don't know how many of you are gripped by that. Many of you seek honor in your workplace with human beings. I wish you'd forsake all that and seek the honor that comes from Almighty God. It'll make all the difference in your life. To me, it's a magnificent promise. For many years, I've sought it with all my heart. God is my witness. I wanted him to honor me. And I said to him, Lord, I don't care what people say about me. It makes absolutely no difference. I want you to honor me. Say that to God and mean it. And forget about the praises and the criticisms of men. Don't get excited when people praise you. Don't get disturbed when people criticize you. The second promise we looked at was Matthew 5 verse 3. That the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is the same thing. Belongs to the poor in spirit. And they are very fortunate and blessed to be envied. Because heaven which is righteousness peace and joy Romans 14 17 comes into our heart imagine a man walking on this wretched earth with heaven in his heart you know a lot most people who walk on the world on earth have got hell in their heart why do I say that hell is a place where there is no mercy Nobody forgives anybody in hell. And when you, when you don't forgive somebody who harmed you, I don't care what the harm is, you don't forgive him. You always look at him in a particular way. You have a little bit of hell in your heart. I don't want even the smell of hell in my heart. Many people have done me harm through the years. I mean, they tried to do me harm. It turned out for my good because I live in Romans 8, 28. But I don't bear any grudge towards any of them. God is my witness. Because I don't want hell in my heart. I mean, if he wants to have hell in his heart, he's welcome. But I'm not going to have hell in my heart. I'm going to have heaven in my heart. Righteousness, love, peace, and joy. If other people want to be anxious and worried, they are welcome. I'm going to have peace. If other people want to have the grumbling, complaining spirit of hell in their hearts, they are welcome. I'm going to have joy. Make that determination. It'll change your life completely as it changed mine. I'll tell you that. The kingdom of God belongs to the poor in spirit. And as I said, the poor in spirit are those who are needy. God doesn't honor everybody. He honors those who honor him. And the third promise we looked in the third session was that his grace is sufficient. Second Corinthians 12 verse 9. His grace is sufficient for every situation you can ever face in your whole life. But that grace is given only to those who are humble. All of us have a lot of pride in our hearts. Everyone. We've got to discover it and get rid of it. Shall I tell you how we discover it? In moments of temptation. That's why it says, count it all joy, brethren, when you are tempted and tried in various ways because you discover layers of this onion called pride that you can peel off. 
And every time you'll peel off a layer of this onion called pride or spiritual pride or intellectual pride or pride of your beauty or pride of any wretched thing you have from Adam. You peel it off, God gives you grace. That's why some people have more grace and some people have less. They peeled off more of the onion, that's all. God is not partial. I believe the church is fantastically poor spiritually. Many of you have prospered materially over the last couple of years. I wonder whether you have grown in grace. If God sees that the thing that excites you is more money, he'll leave you with that. That's all you'll get. But if you go to him and say, Lord, I'm not excited. There are times when I've got more money in the work I do. And I've said, Lord, it doesn't excite me. If I lose it all tomorrow, it's just the same to me. I want your grace. Grace is in the kingdom of God, what money is on the earth. And what you value determines which kingdom you are seeking. You may be surprised to see that you're not seeking the kingdom of God first. If grace means more to you than money, and you can honestly say that before God, you're going in the right direction. Today, <clears throat> I want to speak on this, the conclusion of this, that the ultimate purpose of God is to make us like him. You know, that was God's original purpose for Adam. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, and the mirror is God's word. We know that from James 1, 23 to 25. Beholding in God's word the glory of the Lord Jesus are being transformed into that image that is partaking of God's nature from one degree of glory to another from the Lord the Holy Spirit I mentioned before that verse 17 and 18 are the only places in the whole Bible the only places in the whole Bible where the word Lord refers to the Holy Spirit in every other verse in Scripture Lord refers to the Father Jehovah in the Old Testament or to Jesus the Son of God in the New Testament but in these two places the Holy Spirit is called Lord meaning that you have to give the Holy Spirit complete Lordship over your life if you want him to transform you from one degree of glory to another think of a first-class master carpenter making a perfect table and you keep interfering in his work. You, know, you who know nothing about carpentry, planing it in the wrong place, cutting it in the wrong place, you'll have a shaky, good-for-nothing table because you interfered in his work. You didn't allow him to do it the way he wanted to do it. You didn't follow his instructions. This is why we have multitudes of Christians who year after year after year after year never become more like Christ. Twenty years after they're converted, they're still yelling at their wives and husbands and getting angry and anxious and lusting after women, etc., etc. They sing the most wonderful songs. They rejoice in hearing powerful preaching like Herod loved to hear John the Baptist and then go back from there and watch internet pornography. What is that? It's because like Herod went and watched Salome dancing after he listened to John the Baptist. It didn't make a difference to him. He enjoyed both. There are hypocritical Christians like that today who imagine that they are born again. They are not born again. They said the mantra words, Lord Jesus come into my heart. They haven't repented. They haven't submitted to the Lordship of Christ. They want to go to heaven when they die. They want to have a good time singing praises on the earth. God's promises are not such for such people, I'll tell you that. He looks for those who are serious. When Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, the multitudes of fishermen, why didn't he call all of them? He saw everybody's heart and he knew who was serious. He knew he saw something in people's heart. I want to tell you something, that there is absolutely no partiality with God. If God called Abraham out of those multitudes of idol worshippers in Ur of the Chaldees 4,000 years ago, it's because he saw something in Abraham's heart which other people didn't have. And if he calls somebody today 
and makes him like Christ, it's because he saw something in his heart he didn't see in yours. He probably saw you want religion. So I want to encourage you, my brothers, think of the magnificent promises, think of the fact that you've got only one life to live. Especially you young people, if you can realize you've got only one life to live, and you can choose either to live that according to the principles of God's word or the way the rest of Christendom is going. That's your choice. Because God will never force you. Remember this. You know, there are a lot of people who say that God's grace is irresistible. And that means you can't resist it. If you can't resist God's grace, how in the world are so many people lost? It is resistible. It speaks in the Bible about receiving the grace of God in vain. It speaks about coming short of the grace of God. It's resistible. There are people who say that they believe the saints will persevere, the believers will persevere until the end whether they want to or not. It's a lot of rubbish. Hebrews chapter 3 says, We are made partakers of Christ, verse 12 to 15, if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence firm until the end. Imagine believers who go contrary to all of that teaching and teach because they learned that in some Bible school. It's almost as though they teach that as soon as you become a believer, God makes you a robot. Whether you like it or not, you're going to go to heaven. Whether you like it or not, you're going to persevere until the end. It's not true. God could have made Adam like that. Look at the planets. They have obeyed God in split second obedience for thousands and thousands of years. Imagine if you saw a believer who obeyed God split second even for one year. You'd think it's a miracle in every little thing. Those planets have obeyed God for thousands of years. Is it a miracle that they obey God? No. Because those planets can never sin and they can never be holy. Now God could have made Adam just like us with flesh and bones and blood but inwardly programmed him like a robot who would just walk around doing God's will. 100%, every split second, he'd have lived up to 930 years obeying God every single second and he would never have died. He'd have lived on and on and on and on and on, like the planets. You know what the result would have been? Like the planets, he would not have sinned. He could not have become holy either. Do you understand? You can never be holy unless you have a free will. You can never be holy unless you have a conscience that tells you something is wrong. Dogs have got a free will, but they don't have a conscience. So they can't sin, they can't be holy. But when God created man, he created man with a conscience which he never takes away and with a free will. And it's that free will and the response to your conscience that's made all of us here at different levels of holiness. Today, you are the result of the decisions you made in your whole life. And somebody else sitting next to you may be ten times more holy than you are because he's the result of the decisions he made in his life. And ultimately, when you come to the end of your life, you will be the sum total of all the decisions you made in your life to do the will of God or to do your own will. And he'll never take away that free will from you. When you're born again, he doesn't take it away. When he fills you with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't take it away. I'll tell you who takes away your free will. The devil. I've seen demon-possessed people. And if you have seen them, you know they have no control over their actions. And they wreathe on the, wreathe on the ground like a snake. They're not doing it of their own. They have no control. When they begin to babble something through their mouth, they're not doing it on their own. They're doing it under the control of the evil spirit. Because demons possess people. That's why you read of demon possessed people. But you never read of anybody possessed by the Holy Spirit. You read of people filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know the difference between possessed by a demon and filled with the Holy Spirit? It's free will. 
When you're possessed by a demon, you lose your free will. You lose your control over yourself. You cannot. You may roll on the ground. You may say things you don't plan to say. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have control over yourself. If you fall down, you can get up. When a demon-possessed person is thrown down to the ground by the demon, he can't get up. He just rolls around there. And so when a person says, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I was thrown by the Spirit from one end of the room to the other, I say, brother, that's not the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I have full control of myself. When I preach, God's Holy Spirit anoints me and gives me the words. I know it, even if you don't. But I can stop when I want. I can disobey him as he speaks to me and say something else because I want your honor. Or not say something which he tells me to say because I don't want to hurt anybody because I want their money. It's very easy for a preacher, even when he's standing up, to disobey the Holy Spirit because he's got freedom. When I speak in tongues... I have complete control over myself. I can stop when I want. It's not uncontrollable. If a man says he's got some gift of the Spirit that he cannot control, I say, brother, that's not the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.23 is very clear. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. You are free to choose every moment. And it's that choice that determines whether God is going to Make you like Christ. You can't make yourself like Christ. No matter how hard you try. We can improve our character. There are management seminars that people conduct in companies to teach people to behave better. Behave better is different from being better. You must know that. Behaving better is the wolf in sheep's clothing. He says, bah. Okay. There are management seminars who teach people to say, bah. Act like a sheep. But it's a wolf inside. He forget because the company has to make money. And if you want to see the wolf, just see how he behaves when he goes home. It's very different. He's a wolf again. Because he doesn't have to make put on sheep's clothing at home. There are wolves in sheep's clothing in the church meetings. They say bah. Particularly in praise times. But go home and see how they behave. See what they say there. Slightly different sound. See, it's, you cannot change yourself. You can behave better. You can act better. You can improve your behavior. But you can't change your nature. That is impossible. You can train a pig to try and be clean. You can train a dog, so many things. You know, dog training is an expert art. People teach dogs and monkeys and elephants to do all types of things, <laughs> which they have no interest in doing naturally. You think an elephant has got an interest in standing on one leg? Yeah, absolutely not. He's been trained to do it because he gets a whip or food or something if he does it. Behavior, it's training. That's different from nature. Nature is something inward changing. You can never change it and that's what we need to understand. All the greatest saints in the Old Testament, it was only their behavior that was changed. Not their nature. Their behavior because they had a law. All the people in, this, in the world almost are, in every country, are ruled by the Ten Commandments. The laws of every country are based on that. Ten Commandments. And so if people want to murder somebody, they don't. Not because they don't want to, but because they know they'll be caught. There are people who would like to commit adultery and they don't. Because, not because they don't want to, but because they'll be caught. It's behavior. Restrained by the rules of society, which is fundamentally different from nature. And then the other reason why people behave in a good way is because they want to have a good testimony before people. Have you ever seen a Husband and wife yelling at each other right here in this church meeting. I've never seen it for 32 years. You think for 32 years no husband and wife here ever, ever yelled at each other? Ha, huh, tell me another. But why don't they do it here? Because they lose their testimony. 
They worship their testimony so much. They don't worship God at home. They worship their testimony in the church. They are lovers of themselves, not lovers of God. Where in the world will such people partake of God's nature? Not in a hundred years. Are you serious about partaking of this magnificent promise? That you can partake of his nature, not just change your behavior. I'm not saying you'll change your behavior towards your wife or husband at home. Because in a moment of tension, that will all snap. I'm talking about a changed nature. You see the difference between a worm and a serpent. The devil is called a serpent. In Psalm 22, which begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says in verse 6, I am a worm and no man. You know the position Jesus took? That of a worm. And if you want to know the difference, kick a serpent. Uh, don't try it. I'm just telling you what the difference is. And kick a worm and you'll see the difference. The worm curls up, becomes smaller. With no desire for retaliation. The serpent says, Aha, uh -huh, you did that to me, is it? I'll teach you a lesson you'll never forget. What is your reaction when somebody kicks you? With words or in some other way? You discover pretty soon whether you're following the devil or Jesus. It's a choice you make at that time. A choice. And the sum total of your choice is over a hundred years. Not the way you behave on Sunday morning. Please understand this. Your behavior on Sunday morning for 30 years has never changed your nature. Don't you know that? It's the decisions you make throughout the day. On the road. When somebody doesn't follow the rules of the road. In front of you. In your office. In the train, in the bus, where you see selfishness <coughs> at home, there are decisions you make and that determines what you will be a year from now or 20 years from now. Don't ever forget this. God never takes away that free will from you because the Holy Spirit won't possess you. And say, okay, I'm going to change you. No. He makes us partake of his nature. It's an offer. And I can, just like the other promises I mentioned earlier, he'll honor you if you honor him. He'll give you the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace and joy in heaven if you are poor and needy and aware of your own need and stop judging other people. He will give you his grace if you humble yourself. And he will make you like Jesus if you allow the Holy Spirit to be Lord in every situation. It's a condition. But who wouldn't want to be? I mean, if, if God came to me in a physical form and said, do you want to be like the devil or you want to be like Jesus? You got to be off your head to think that I'll say I want to be like the devil. Would you say that? No. But the point is this. It's in the moment of temptation and trial not in the church meeting, but afterwards, that in that moment the Lord asks you, what do you want, whom do you want to be like? Remember this. That's what the Lord is asking you in the moment of temptation. Yeah. As you sit in front of your computer and you're tempted to go to sites you shouldn't go to, the Holy Spirit is asking you, whom do you want to be like? You make a choice there. With a the click of your mouse, you made a choice. You can repent, of course you can repent. You know, it's like coming to a hundred meters race and you come to the starting line and you run one meter and you fall down. Can you get up? Of course you can get up. You can run another half a meter and fall down again and get up. When will you finish your hundred meters at this rate? Maybe in a few years, where others have finished in 10, 12 seconds. That's the difference. You know, I want to tell you honestly, my dear brothers and sisters, I've known of many of you for many years. And I'll tell you plainly, some of you should have been way further in the Christian life than you are right now. 
I don't know anything about your private life and I don't want to know. But when I see and hear you, I know the decisions you've made in your private life in the last few years. There'll be a grace, a tremendous anointing and grace. I don't mean preaching ability. No, that's a gift. I'm not talking about gift. I'm talking about grace and character that'll come if you've made the right choices. The right choice meaning the Holy Spirit's going to be Lord and not me. Have you heard, seen this expression in the Old Testament in Psalm? In the book of Psalms, I think it's Psalm 12, just a minute. <clears throat> See, Psalm 12 is the James 3 of the Old Testament. James 3 is the chapter on the tongue. And Psalm 12 is the chapter on the tongue. Two great chapters on the tongue. And Psalm 12 begins with, Lord, the godly man ceases to exist. Faithful people disappear. Why? Mainly because the way they use their tongue. It's all about the tongue, the whole chapter. The way human beings use their tongue. And verse 6 onwards, how godly people will use their tongue. What do ungodly people say about their tongue? <clears throat> verse 4, they have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Think the Holy Spirit is going to be Lord over my tongue? Rubbish. Our tongues are our own. I'll do what I like. My forefinger is my own. I'll click on the mouse wherever I like. Holy Spirit's not going to be Lord. I'm Lord over my <laughs> forefinger to click the mouse wherever I want it. Fine. You will be the sum total of all the choices you've made in a few years from now. It's choices, choices. Who is going to be Lord? Who is going to tell us? It says here, we are Lord. Who is going to tell us how we are going to use our tongue or our finger or our mind or, any, or my, anything? Okay. God says, okay. I'm not going to make you like the planets, a robot. You make your choice. But the offer is there. If we allow the Holy Spirit to be Lord, He will change us. It's a promise. We are transformed from one degree of glory to another, to another, to another. Remember what I said, my brothers and sisters. You can change your behavior and make it wonderful. But you can't change your nature. God has to give us another nature. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. As I said in the Old Testament, they could change their behavior because of the law. You see that in the example of David. You know, when he was running away from Absalom, there was a man called Shimei who cursed him. But Absalom was killed and when David came back, Shimei was, got scared and came back and bowed before him and said, Oh, I'm sorry. And David was so grateful to God for having brought him back to the throne that in that moment he was very merciful. You know, when, you, when you're running for your life, it's pretty easy to be merciful to people. And when you're in tough spots and in the desert and struggling and God is good to you, it's very easy to be merciful. If you started with rags and you suddenly got a good salary and a good job, it's very easy to be merciful. But after a few years of David sitting on the throne and he forgot all about God's mercy on his deathbed, he tells Solomon, don't spare that fellow Shimei. Make sure his gray hair is filled with blood as he goes to the grave. David changed his behavior. He couldn't change his nature. But David's in heaven because those were the days before the Holy Spirit came. There was no promise in the Old Testament that I'll change your nature. He could be a man after God's own heart in his external conduct. Not in his heart. That's the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Do you know even John the Baptist couldn't change his nature? He was the greatest man that ever was ever born. From the time of Adam to Jesus, the greatest was John the Baptist. Jesus said that. Not even his mother. John the Baptist was greater. Jesus said that. But even he, Matthew 11, 11, it says, the least in the kingdom of God 
let me paraphrase it, has got a greater opportunity than John the Baptist. Why? Because he could only change his behavior. But in the kingdom of God, your nature can be changed. You don't have to be a wolf in lamb's clothing. You can be a lamb, a sheep yourself, all the way down to the center. That's nature. I praise God. I, want, I don't believe there's a greater promise in the whole Bible when it says this is the most magnificent of God's promises. It's absolutely true. God Almighty, if he can give me his nature, boy. <laughs> you think even if you become a billionaire and the richest man on earth, it's better than that? You've got to be crazy to want that. I'm amazed at so many Christians with this wonderful, magnificent promise in scripture, don't seem to actively pursue it. That's because they believe that other things are more valuable. Think of the millions of Christians who are being deceived today into thinking that all that Jesus has come to give us is more money, a better house, a better car. And when you ask God, ask God for a car. There are some people who say, even ask God, to tell him the color of car you want. He'll tell you even that. Faith for all this rubbish and what is the result of pursuing all these things? And health, healing, healing, healing. And what's the result of pursuing all this? You miss the greatest thing of all. There's a proverb in English called the good is the enemy of the best. You understand that? To have money, is that a good thing? Definitely. Go and ask any beggar. Go and ask any poor man. To have health, is that a good thing? Definitely. Go and ask anybody in a hospital. I believe if I can keep money as my servant, it's a very good thing. It's a terrible master, but a very good servant. And it doesn't matter if you have a lot of it, if you make it your servant. The moment it becomes your master, running your life, telling you what to do, ah, you have destroyed. The same way with health. Health is my servant, not my master. I'd rather pray and be fit in my soul and read God's word than go on some bodybuilding program in some gym. It's not, I'm not here to show off my muscles to other people. I'm here to make sure that I register the victory of Christ in the territory of the devil in my short life on earth. That's what I'm more interested in. So health is a good thing, but it's not my master, it's my servant. I use health to serve God. I have prayed frequently for health. Every time I'm sick, I ask Jesus to heal me. Why? Because it's my servant. I wanted to serve me, to serve my God and my master. Make it your servant. Health and money and all are very good things, provided they are your servants. But this good things can be the enemy of the best. If you miss the best, that is God's nature. And I'll never sacrifice that to get this. You know, we can't pursue so many things in life. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians, in chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, he said. <clears throat> verse 12. I have not yet become perfect. What does he mean by that? What do you think he meant by that? Do you think he meant that he has not yet reached the whole world? He hasn't traveled to India to preach the gospel. He hasn't traveled to China to preach the gospel. He hasn't traveled to Australia, New Zealand to preach the gospel. That's not what he was talking about. He was saying, I have not yet become like Jesus. I have not yet become perfect. But I press on. To lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. There's a phrase which is very common among evangelical Christians. Saved to serve. Paul didn't believe that. Paul believed he was saved to become like Jesus. And service was the overflow of that. Because people have believed saved to serve. They think the main thing is ministry. 
I've got to reach this place with the gospel, that place is gone. I've got to give this tract here and preach here and preach there and preach there. And look at the character of some of these people who go around doing this. They love money till the day they die. Imagine living with a disease till the day you die. <laughs> a disease that ruins you spiritually. They get angry until the day they die. It's not only that. They're not ashamed, some of these women preachers, to stand up in, a, uh, in front of a television and say, I yelled, I got angry with my husband. Hey, you should go and hang your head in shame somewhere and not talk about that as if that's normal Christianity to comfort all those people sitting there who say, ah, if she does it, then I can do it too. I want to testify the truth. I never yell at my wife 365 days of the year because God's grace is sufficient for every provocation. Go and ask all these people who have worked with me in 32 years in this church office or co-workers and ask them how many of them I got angry with and yelled my head off. You think none of them ever did anything wrong? God's grace is sufficient to speak the truth, yes, but we are not, we are supposed to have control over ourselves. Dear brothers and sisters, there is a life that you can live close to the heart of God if you make a choice to let the Holy Spirit be Lord. Of course, you will lose certain earthly things. I've lost money trying to follow the Lord, but I don't regret it because I got something better. I've lost honor, worldly honor, following the Lord. I don't regret it because I got God's honor. You have to make a choice because you're going to lose something and the Lord says, Do you want, are you willing to lose that to get this? Yeah. So he says here, this, I'm pressing on, and he says, verse 13, there's in the middle, there's only one thing I do. Not 25 things. What was the one thing? You go to past Paul and say, Paul, what's this thing you said about one thing you do? What's the one thing you're doing? Today, if you ask people, they sound spiritual and say, ah, oh, to reach the world for Christ. Do you know the number of Christian organizations whose title is World Outreach? Some small village, they start something and World Outreach. And some other place, there's another World Outreach. It's all ways of making money. But if you were to go to Paul and say, what's your one aim? He says, it's not World Outreach, no. <laughs> I leave that with God. Paul never did have World Outreach. You know, he just went to a few countries around the Mediterranean. That's all. Peter didn't even do that much. They, if you look at the area of the world they covered with the gospel, it's less than about 5%. It wasn't world outreach at all. <laughs> Many of you have traveled more than the Apostle Paul. But you know what is the one thing he wanted to do? It was to lay hold of, verse 12, what Christ laid hold of him for. Christ laid hold of him when he was on the Damascus road and said, Paul, I want to make you like me. And Paul said, I want to lay hold of that. And in his pursuit of that, he preached the gospel, traveled here, sacrificed, sacrificed, did so many things. But his goal was not to reach the world. His goal was to become like Jesus. So, <clears throat> You need to decide what your goal is. And if your goal is the same, and you'll say, Lord, I want that in my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. Let me show you a verse in James in chapter 1 to convince you of what I'm trying to say. It begins with, <clears throat> it's talking about holiness. You know, choices, choices, choices. James chapter 1, first of all he says in verse 4, Let endurance have its perfect result, so that you can become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You can become perfect. Paul pursued perfection. Let us press on to perfection. But he says how to get there. Endure. Endure. In where endure? Verse 4. Three, consider it two and three. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various types of trials and temptations in your life, because that is where your faith is tested. 
Your faith is not tested here. The testing of faith is not a written paper. Tick off, tick off. Do you believe in the doctrinal statement of this church? That's not the test of your faith. That's how people test people's faith nowadays. Do you agree with all these doctrinal statements? Even the devil can agree with all that. The testing of your faith is in the time of trial. When you're tempted, when you're tested in different situations, there, endure. The testing of your faith, if you respond correctly, you endure. And if you keep enduring, as I said, the sum total of all those decisions, one day you'll become perfect. Like Jesus. So, <clears throat> verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. It's easy to overcome one sin. No, he's talking about persevering. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. How do you think these marathon runners break world records? They're getting close to two hours now, running 26 miles. Running, running, running all those 40 kilometers. Step after step after step, endure, endure, endure. You think they don't feel like giving up? Go and ask any marathon runner, even the world champion. He'll tell you, I felt like giving up a hundred times, but I was determined to break the record. I tell you, if we had more Christians like those marathon runners, We'd have revival in the world. We'd have revival in this church. Those marathon runners discipline themselves. They don't eat what they like. They go out for runs in the morning whether they feel like it or not. Most of the time they don't feel like it. But they get up and go because they want to get that prize and break the world record. I tell you they put most Christians to shame. Who are too lazy to read the Bible who are too lazy to respond in the moment of temptation the way God wants them to. We can learn a lesson. Paul tells, speaks about that. And he says, those guys do it for some empty gold medal that is forgotten. Can you tell me who won the marathon eight years ago at the Olympics? Anybody? You don't know, right? <laughs> the next day after it happened, you all knew about it. It was in the paper, but you don't know it today. That's the empty honor of this world. Imagine pursuing that, where your name's forgotten within a week. Just for a moment, one gold medal. And here's something far greater. To become like Christ, be with him for all eternity. And he says, the one who perseveres, when he's approved finally, James 1.12, he'll get a crown of life. Which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, just read that verse again. To whom is the crown of life promised? To whom? I want to ask you a question. To those who persevere under trial or to those who love the Lord? It's a bit confusing, right? Both are the same. <laughs> if you love the Lord, you'll persevere under trial. That's the meaning. That's the meaning of that verse. How do I prove I love the Lord? According to James 1.12. I persevere under trial. Don't any of you think you love Jesus if you don't persevere when you're tempted, tested. That's the time you discover whether you love the Lord or not. And then he goes on to say how, you know, how sin, when you're tempted, he says that's not sin. God doesn't tempt anybody. He allows the devil to tempt, but he doesn't tempt anyone. Uh, our lusts tempt us. And when our desire conceives you know it's like uh, the temptation comes and I yield to it the devil came and tempted Eve that wasn't wrong there was no she didn't sin then but when she yielded it's like the union of a man and a woman produces a conception <clears throat> so temptation can come to your mind that's not sin even Jesus was tempted in his mind, jump off the roof of the temple. He said, no. So if a bad thought comes to your mind, that's not sin. <laughs> if you reject it, it's not a sin. If you accept it in your mind, when then a conception takes place in your mind, then it's sin. And that will finally lead to death. <clears throat> if you endure, you get life, verse 12. And the other way, if you keep on going that way, you'll end up in death. So he says, <clears throat> verse 16, don't be deceived about all this. 
Don't think that there's not going to be a final end to the direction in which you're going. If you persevere under trial, the crown of life, if you keep on yielding to your lust, death, no matter what other people in the church think about you. And then he says in verse 17, <clears throat> every good and perfect gift can only come from above. It can never come by your own effort or by anything on earth. And the best and most perfect gift is God's own nature. Think of that phrase in verse 17 as referring to God's nature. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. God's nature can only come from there. I can't produce it. But like the previous verses say, I have to make a decision. When I'm tempted to make that lust conceive, I say no. It's exactly like a <clears throat> young girl saying no to an attractive man who is not God's will for her. Sorry, I'm not going to be the mother of your baby. The Bible says the devil is the father of lies. He's the father of many other sins, but he's got to find a woman. He's got to find a person in whom, whom he can join with and produce that sin. And if you say, no, I'm not going to yield to you. There's no conception. There's no sin. You can hear the voice of the devil all the time, like thoughts in your mind. You say, no, no, no. You don't have to condemn yourself for thoughts that come to your mind. That'll come till the day you die. You can be sitting in a church like this and have the most horrible thought imaginable come to your mind. That's a temptation. You don't have to condemn yourself for that. You say, no, I'm not going to sin. <clears throat> but only God can give you his nature. That comes from above. You make the choice. You say, no. Then that perfect gift only God can give. Again, James 1.17 reminds me. I can improve my behavior, but I cannot change my nature. Only God can do that because it's a good and perfect gift that can only come from above. Turn to John's Gospel, chapter 12. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says, before that, 2 Corinthians 3.18 again, before we go there. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we saw, we are looking at the second part of how the Holy Spirit transforms us from one degree of glory to another makes us like Christ. The first part it says the Holy Spirit shows us the glory of Jesus in the scriptures. The mirror <clears throat> we saw in James 1 is referring to the word of God, the perfect law of liberty. God's word is called the perfect law of liberty in James 1. It's a, it's a word that's called to set me at liberty. And the Holy Spirit is called here in 2 Corinthians 3.17, someone who brings that liberty. And verse 18 he says, when we come to the scriptures with an unveiled face, we see the glory of the Lord. But if you, if you don't come to see the glory of the Lord in the scriptures, it says here in verse 15 that when they read God's word in those days, that was only the book of Moses, a veil lies over their heart. I mean, if you put a cloth over your eyes and try to read the Bible, you're not going to get you're not going to see the glory. That's the point. You know what happens? <clears throat> when you read the Bible and you see doctrine there, you got a veil over your heart. You can read it and study it like a chemistry book. But when the veil is removed, how do you know the veil is removed? You see the scriptures and you see the glory of Jesus. That's the way to know whether there's a veil over your heart when you read the Bible. To this day, it says, to this day, verse 15, there's a veil over their heart when they read the Bible. But if they turn to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the veil will be taken away. If they go to the Holy Spirit and say, God, I can't understand this. Holy Spirit of God, show me. You know what he'll show you? He won't show you a doctrine. He'll show you the glory of Jesus. He won't show you a sermon to preach. There are people who study the Bible to get sermons to preach. There's a veil over their heart. 
Let me tell you, study the scriptures to become like Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit will show you. If you study the scriptures in order to get doctrine, good. But it's not the greatest thing. Doctrine is like the five fingers, five toes, ten toes, ten fingers, ears, eyes and all that. But life, what's the use of all this without life? Life of Jesus is the ultimate thing. And the Holy Spirit wants to show us the glory of Jesus in the scriptures. And you know you, the veil is removed when you can't come to see the glory of Jesus in the scriptures. I remember in my early days I used to go to an assembly where every morning we were told to kneel down and read the Bible, kneel down and read the Bible before we went to bed at night and we did it. You know, lots of full-time workers, we did that early morning. But I, I was young. And I looked around and I saw these people, they would get up from their knees and go and fight with each other and run after money and everything. I said, this, what's the use of all this reading the Bible? It didn't seem to change their nature. It didn't even seem to change their behavior. <laughs> Leave alone nature. They would study the Bible to become better preachers. To have a message for Sunday morning. They study the Bible in order to understand doctrine. No, there's a veil. That's why you don't become like Jesus. Many of you have read the Bible for many, many years. Why haven't you become more like Jesus? It says here when we look at the mirror without, without a veil, we see the glory of Jesus. I want to encourage you. Whenever you go to the scriptures, say, Spirit of God, show me the glory of Jesus. Don't fill my head with empty knowledge. Don't let me study this like a history book to get facts, to answer an examination. I want to see the glory of Jesus. I tell you, it's changed my whole life to be able to see that Jesus came in my flesh and was tempted like me and to see how he lived his earthly life. Throughout the New Testament, I see it. Now let's turn to John 12. See a little bit of the glory of Jesus here. How can we see the glory of Jesus? John chapter 12. We read here about certain Greeks in verse 20, 21, 20 and 21. They came to Philip and they said what you're saying right now. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus in the scriptures. They said that. We want to see Jesus. And Philip told Andrew and Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus, Lord, there are certain people here who want to see you. And the Lord said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The Lord gave some funny answers to people who asked straightforward questions. But you need to understand behind that, the words he spoke were spirit and life. He said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And if you want to see me, you'll have to fall into the ground and die. Truly, truly, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground, earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He was talking about his own death first. Fruit can come through my life only if I die. Is it only referring to him? No. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you hate your life in this world, you'll keep it. And if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And then, where I am, there my servant will also be. And then you will see him. That's the way to see Jesus today. You have to fall into the ground and die. I know how the Lord spoken that word to me many times through more than 30 years. Fall into the ground and die. Die to your reputation. Die to what people think about you. Die to... Don't always want to be a nice corn of wheat grain of wheat in a glass case admired by everybody no let it go down lose all its beauty uh, be ignored and despised and crushed and trampled underfoot but when it goes underground something will come out of it a hundred grains of wheat on the other hand you keep it in a glass case everybody to admire this golden grain of wheat it'll remain one even after a hundred years you have a choice all of us have a choice in every situation, the choice is, am I willing to fall into the ground and die? 
or not. And here is where I have to follow him. When I face trial, temptation, what shall I say? Verse 27, when my soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from all this. Get me out of this situation somehow or the other. No. This is the whole purpose for which I came. Father, glorify your name. You know, when we are in trouble or trial or temptation, we can go to God with two prayers. Lord, get me out of this somehow or the other. Or, Father, glorify your name. Jesus said, I will not say, get me out of this. I'll say, Father, glorify your name. And a voice came out of heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The others couldn't hear the words. It says, verse 29, the crowd said, oh, that was thunder, wasn't it? They couldn't hear a word of what God said. And somebody said, oh, an angel spoke or something. But Jesus only heard it. And I'll tell you something. It's the one who falls into the ground and dies who hears God speaking to him. The others don't know. You want to hear God speaking to you? Do you want to see Jesus like the Greeks? You want to see him today? Think of Jesus' answer. Follow me. Fall into the ground and die. In the moment of trial and temptation, say, Lord, I die to my own choice. Here's the promise. 2 Timothy 2 verse 11. If we die with him, we will live with him. I choose to go down to give up my the desire that my I, the choice to satisfy my desire. I die to what my eyes want me to look at, what my forefinger wants to click on, <laughs> coming from my heart. I die to these choices. Yeah, a moment of pain instead of a moment of pleasure. You know, sin always offers me a moment of pleasure and a lifetime of pain. I choose instead a moment of pain and a lifetime of pleasure. Who is the wiser man? The man who chooses a moment of pleasure for a lifetime of regret and sorrow? Or the one who chooses a moment of pain and self-denial for a lifetime of joy and happiness? That's the wiser man. That's Jesus saying, just be wise. Don't be like all the other people. Die and you will live with him. Brothers and sisters, don't study the Bible to get messages. Don't study the Bible to get knowledge. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you the beauty of Jesus in the scriptures to change you to be like him. God's wonderful, magnificent promise. We can partake of his own nature. We can love people like he loved. We can be gentle as he was gentle. We can be strict as he was strict at the right time. We can rebuke like he rebuked. We can encourage like he encouraged. We can be at rest in our heart no matter what people do or say. And we will always rejoice in the Lord. And that will satisfy the heart of God that at last he found a people on earth who would fulfill his original purpose for Adam with which he sent Jesus to earth. May God find satisfaction in our hearts through what he sees. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your wonderful, precious, magnificent promises. They are so great. You have opened our eyes to see some of them. You have opened our eyes to see the conditions. And every one of us can partake of them. Help us, Lord, we pray. That we will be wise for our lives on earth are so short. Year by year slips by. We've made many wrong decisions in the past. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in the inward man with grace. That we shall make the right choices in the days to come. And be transformed from one degree of glory to another. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.